Hey friends, welcome to Worship at Ginghamsburg, wherever you may be joining us from today. Whether you're online or right here in our Tip City campus, welcome. We are so excited that you're here with us for worship today. My name is John. I'm part of the staff team here at Ginghamsburg, and I'm glad you're with us. I'm excited you're with us, and I am excited for how God is going to move and work and speak to you today. So to get things started, I have a question for you. I usually do this, and uh, we're starting a brand new teaching series today, and, and I, this question may divide households. And I apologize in advance. But the question for today, it's a yes or no question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Is a hot dog a sandwich? When I asked the worship team earlier today, they agreed with you. There was a resounding chorus of no's. But Zane did some, some research for us. And the technically correct answer is yes. It is considered an open-faced sandwich. So... Let us know in the chat what you think. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Turn to your neighbor. Is a hot dog a sandwich? It's, uh, that's, I, I love the research and the conversation happening. So, like I said, it may divide households. Ginghamsburg Church accepts no responsibility. Or, or well, yeah, you got it. Anyways, more important things to talk about than a hot dog today. <laughs> But again, I want to say welcome. We are glad that you're here today, especially if you are joining us for the first time as a guest today. Welcome. We're so excited you're here. And maybe you're a guest with us online. Would you take a moment and let us know that you're here? And I promise we're not going to spam your email. We're not going to blow up your phone. We want to connect with you and build a relationship with you. So if you're a guest online, you can text the word online to 937-358-6710. Or you can visit ginghamsburg.org slash online check-in, and you can hit the I'm new button, and we'll connect with you and help you find your next steps to get connected. Now, if you're a guest here in our Tip City campus, I want to ask you to grab that card that you'll see in the seat pocket in front of you. It has a QR code on it. Just take a moment, fill that out, and then head out to the lobby where the donuts are. And my friends Maggie and Susie are hanging out there. They'll answer any questions you might have. And we have a gift for you out there. So we'd love to connect with you there. Now, maybe you've had a relationship with Ginghamsburg for a while, and we want to stay connected with you as well. So if you're joining us online, head to ginghamsburg.org slash online check-in and hit that check-in button. Or if you're joining us here in our Tip City campus, you can check in by scanning the QR code. You can fill out that card and place it in the offering basket in a few moments. Or you can sign in or check in through the Ginghamsburg app. You can also see the, the calendar, all kinds of other great resources on the Ginghamsburg app. Now, we always like to talk about staying connected in community. And so I want to encourage you today, if you have not yet, check out our Facebook groups. We have the Ginghamsburg group, and then we also have our Ginghamsburg Praise Facebook groups. There are links available for both of those in the chat if you're joining us online today. And I also want to encourage you to check out our Discord server if you haven't done that yet as well. It's a great place to hang out and to connect with others. Now, today we're celebrating communion at the end of our celebration today. And so if you're joining us online, Online, I'd encourage you to take a moment, maybe head to your kitchen, grab some bread or some juice or whatever you may have, because Jesus eats with everyone. Now today, we're kicking off a brand new teaching series called United in a Divided World. And something as simple as a hot dog can divide us. What about all of the more important things in our lives? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so Pastor Dennis is going to be teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and bookmark that, whether it's in your Bible app, whether it's in your Bible, so you can be ready as we hear this word today. And so as we're gathered in this place, I want to encourage you to let's lean in today. Let's listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let's listen for what God is speaking, what God is doing, and how God is moving. God is not just sitting in a corner somewhere. God is constantly moving and working. So I want to encourage you, let's, let's approach this time of worship today with a heart of expectation, with a heart of seeing where and how God is moving so that we can, we can experience his presence together today. And so as we worship, again, I just want to encourage you, Let's listen for the Holy Spirit, and let's seek God together today. So again, we're glad you're here, and let's worship together today.
Good morning, church. You guys don't mind standing as we worship our Savior this morning. We're declaring that He's our firm foundation, church. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, oh, I never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I. I still got joy in chaos. I got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be going under. See, I'm not held by my own strength. See, I built my life on Jesus. You never.
Amen. Amen. Feel free to take your seats for a moment. Spoiler alert. You may not agree with the person sitting next to you. Or maybe you may not agree with your friends on Facebook. Whatever it may be. I hate to burst that bubble today, but you guys thought the hot dog question was going to divide households. Just wait. I have a list. And these, these are, here is your lunchtime conversation today. So, case in point, when you are eating a bowl of cereal, what goes in the bowl first? Is it the cereal or is it the milk? Cereal, okay. Next question, what is the ideal temperature for your air conditioning? I hear 68, 65. Let us know in the chat, what is your ideal air conditioning temperature? I, I joked about my in-laws. My father-in-law keeps it at like 62 degrees all the time. So it's like August and I need a sweater. But he's not here, so he can't make fun of me today. Okay, next one. Superhero debates. Who would win a fight between Spider-Man and Batman? Spider-Man, I, I would tend to agree. Tend to agree. I love Batman, but I would agree. I think Spider-Man wins this one. Okay. These are just the warm-up questions. Here we go. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes or no? Okay, I hear, I hear, I'm hearing more yeses than noes. Let us know in the chat. Pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Okay. All right. These, these have all been the warm-up. Here is the debate to end all debates. Which way does the toilet paper go? Does it go over the top or underneath? Over the top or underneath? <laughs> Rachel Miller was telling me that the, the guy who patented the toilet paper roll got it wrong. So I'll let you decide which one is right or wrong. But you know what? Our, our debates, these have been a lot of fun, but our debates can get really serious. We disagree on politics and ethics and economics, climate change, education, health care, foreign policy, sexuality, race. The list goes on and on. So many more things. And disagreements have split our church in the past. Disagreements are still splitting the church as a whole. But today, we're going to talk about what it means to surrender to a more excellent way. Today, we are going to learn what it means to be united in a divided world because we are taking a stand on the rock, the rock that is Jesus Christ, the firm foundation who will never fail. So if you're able, I want to encourage you, let's stand together. If you're joining us online, join us as we worship, as we lift up the name of Jesus together today. Church, let's worship. We serve a great God. Amen. He's a powerful, all-knowing. Give him glory. Help us sing the song. We all know it. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Oh, into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. Yeah. 
our journey through this world that can oftentimes bring confusion, bring doubt. We need the Lord. Amen. That's what this next song says. And again, it's one we all know, and I want you guys to lift your voice and worship and reverence. I'll fall on you. 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour. I need you. You, my one, depends my righteousness. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless you on today, Jesus. We worship your holy and matchless name. Lord Jesus, we're just, we're calling on you because we need you, Father. Lord, we all come from different places, different backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, different needs, different wants, different desires, Lord Jesus. But one thing that we have in common is that we need you, Jesus. We need you, Lord. We need your guidance. We need your protection, Lord. We thank you for protecting our leader on this week and what could have been a very tragic accident, Lord. We thank you for that protection, Lord. And we, we just ask that you continue to rain down your spirit, Father. Lord, bless this church, bless this community, bless our online audience, Lord Jesus. Touch, let them feel your spirit on the day, Lord Jesus. Be inspired by your word, Jesus. Let walls continue to come down, Lord Jesus, as we lift your name up with a pure and humble heart, Lord Jesus. We just wanna lead with love once a day, and we thank you, we bless you, we acknowledge you, and we love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, feel free to take your seats. So what is it that truly unites people? Usually, usually it's a common goal. When you think about conflict mediation, the entire purpose is to find common ground between enemies. 
When two or more people work towards the same outcome, it creates a bond that overcomes fear. Fear is what divides enemies. But teamwork is what unites friends. And think about it this way. Every enemy is a friend in waiting. So that's why we love participating in events like the Living City Project. Last year, there were over 700 volunteers at 22 different serving locations, and they picked up over 128 tons of trash and debris. Working together, we can make an even bigger impact this year as we let love lead. So check out livingcityproject.org for more information. You can find where the serving locations are. You can find the times. You can register to serve. So livingcityproject.org. Maybe it is picking up trash with strangers. Maybe it's hanging out with other creators at our creator group this Thursday. Or maybe it's being a chaperone for Celebrity Blitz happening this Friday night for our third through fifth graders. Or maybe it's something as simple as grabbing a, a group of people and going bowling together. Every opportunity that you'll find on the Ginghamsburg events calendar is an opportunity to intentionally spend time with someone who is different than you. It's training. We're getting our reps. We're putting in the work. In order to be united in a divided world, we've got to put love into practice. So you can do this by joining a life group or getting involved. The Jesus life is always an adventure. So let me encourage you just to, a great way to get started. Scan that QR code or visit ginghamsburg.org slash online check-in if you're joining us online. And right there, we'll, we'll give you some next steps, get you connected with our team, and we'll help you take your next step as you enter this Jesus life alongside of many others who want to walk with you. So living the Jesus life is certainly an adventure, but it's also a life of faith and trust. And I would say that adventure goes hand in hand with faith and trust. We trust Jesus with our purpose, with our calling. We trust Jesus for wisdom and discernment and direction. We trust Jesus for his provision. So this is why we take an opportunity every week to live out our life of trust through our giving and through our generosity. Everything that we have, our gifts, our ideas, our talents, our skills, they've all been given to us by the Lord. And our responsibility is to be a good steward of those gifts. So as we give towards the mission of God through Ginghamsburg Church, we're doing so as an act of faith. We're saying, God, I trust you. Jesus, I'm giving you my first and my best today. So as we take this step of faith together, you can give at ginghamsburg.org slash give. You can place your gift in the offering basket as it comes down your row in just a moment, or you can leave your gift in the boxes outside the worship center doors. So as we give today, let's do so with faith. And let's believe that God's best is yet to come. You can go and build a mighty mansion But with no family, all that house just goes to waste you can fix a feast to feed an army But with no friends, there's no need to celebrate Back in the beginning, there were two in the garden No, we were never made to be alone God knows People need, people need, people need people Father, there's nothing better when the kids all come together. People need, people need, people need people. 
I love that. Hey, thanks for coming out. I'm Pastor Dennis. Good to see each and every one of you today. Welcome to those worshiping online. If you're a guest today, here in-house or online, thanks for joining us. We're kicking off a brand new teaching series entitled United in a Divided World. And certainly we need a message series like this. It's no surprise to any of us here that we are around seven months from a presidential election and we are a divided nation. Seems like we're divided about everything. We're divided on politics, we're divided on news sources, we're we're divided over race, we're even divided over chicken sandwiches, Chick-fil-A or Popeyes. We're divided, and we live in a time where much of the church of Jesus Christ universal is divided, and even in our own faith tradition, the Methodist tradition, we're divided. We're divided over theology. We're divided over worship styles. What kind of music do we sing? We are divided over social and cultural issues. We're divided. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to take some time to address the elephant in the room. And I pray that it'll be a blessing to each of you as we live in a divided time, that we will find unity in the essentials and we'll grow together to be a witness as we, in the words of John Wesley, offer them Christ, as we offer 
Christ to the world. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump right into it today. We're going to address united and a divided church. We'll talk about that. And then next week, we're going to go on to greater things in the nation. Don't miss a one. Spread the news. I pray that it's going to be encouraging, not defeating, and I pray it'll be a blessing. One of the things that I love about Gingsburg Church is that we are a multiracial, multi-generational Jesus movement. We are not perfect. If you are a guest here today, I admit, this is senior pastor talking here, this is not the perfect church. We've got problems. We do. Why? Because Dennis Miller's a senior pastor, and he's imperfect. I nearly wrecked my motorcycle yesterday, but I'm alive to tell. Amen? So, we, well, thank you, Lord. Yeah, it's a long story. I'll tell you about it later. But I'm here. So, we're not the perfect place, but we know the perfect one, Jesus, who makes all things new. What we do know is that our answers to life are found in the Christ, not in human solutions. Although God often uses humans to bring about kingdom work. We'll talk more about that later. Ultimately, we know that our answers to life are found in a higher kingdom. The uniqueness about this Jesus movement of the first century was that it was a countercultural movement within the Roman Empire. One of the things that grabs me about the early church is the fact that those early believers did not believe that if we just elected the right emperor to Rome, our world would be straightened out. <laughs> If we just had the right government in Rome, then everything would be a utopia. No. They changed the world by giving their lives away in love. And so today, I want to jump right in, and I want to tell you about a very messy church. It was the church at Corinth. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Corinth was an ancient city in the Greco-Roman world. And I want to read these words to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. You can follow along. This is from the NIV. If you have your Bibles or you can read on your smartphone or the screen. The Apostle Paul, writing this letter to this messy church, says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another says, I follow Apollos, another says, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Among that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence. Yes, the, the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is God's word for us today from the scripture. Amen. It's no secret that here at Gainsburg Church, with all of the successes and ministries over the past three decades, that over the past decade, we've had much division. We've had several people leave our church. We've had several splits, and we named that. 
We've had people leave for political reasons, for social reasons, for many different reasons. We've went through several senior pastors, and I've been here the last two years. But it's also no secret that we've been in the midst of a renewal time. We've been in the midst in the last few years of a revival time, that we're coming back. But what we need to know, even though that we're not immune to quarrels and controversies, that the early church had its share of division and controversies, that we're not on an island alone. In fact, we see a church in Corinth that was a mess. It experienced several divisions, as we shall see in our text today. Fussing and fighting within churches has been going on for 2,000 years. So let's consider the church at Corinth. I want to unpack this a little bit historically today. Now, Corinth was an ancient city in what we know today is the country of Greece. It was 60 miles southwest of Athens, the capital. Today, you can visit there on a tour and see its ruins. But in the first century, it was a major city of commerce, while Athens to the north was the center of the empire of learning and philosophy and logic. Corinth to the south was the center of that region of commerce, of trade, It was where sailors came, where merchants came, tradesmen came. It was a great city of entertainment. It was a city of vice. It was the Las Vegas of the ancient world. It was considered sin city. It had a reputation even in the first century about being a Corinthian. There were things associated with that. On a hill overlooking the city was the great temple to the goddess Aphrodite, which was a fertility god, where it was said that there were at least a thousand sex slaves, prostitutes, who would serve in temple rituals to this god. It was a great, great... It was a place of great paganism. And why I mention that is because in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul makes reference that many of these new believers, these new Jesus followers, they came out of that vice. They came out of that lifestyle. That's why he's writing in the Corinthian letters about you are a new creation in Christ. The old things are gone. Behold, all things have become new. That they were new people. That they they had baggage. They had a past. But it seems like when he's firing off this letter to the Corinthian church, this new church, that the moral sleaze of the city had come back into the church over time. That they weren't connecting the dots of how they were living on Saturday night and how they were worshiping on Sunday morning. They were like divorcing those two things. That never happens today, does it? And the Apostle Paul is dressing all this chaos in the church. We have no problems here compared to what they had. He mentioned, and I'm not going to go through the whole letter. You can read it yourself. That's why we have Bible study. That there were some members of the church who were suing one another in secular court. Uh, their communion experience looked more like a Greek toga party than it did a religious experience. And get this. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. You can read it yourself. He even addresses a man in the church who's having a sexual affair with his stepmother. How creepy is that? (laughs) And over and over, they had divided into cliques. They were following preachers instead of following Jesus. That never happens today, does it? (laughs) He, He goes on, literally, in the text, he says, some of you have divided up their divisions in the church. He says, Some of you are following Paul. I follow Paul, the preacher. I follow Peter, the preacher. I follow Apollos. Who's that? He was a great orator of the first century. Um, I followed this pastor for a while. You know, I was here during the church when this pastor was the pastor. I, I like this pastor. I'm going down the street to see this pastor. 
That's what they were doing. And then there's always the religious group, the, 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 ho- the holier than now groups. But we don't follow any preacher. We just follow Christ. <laughs> he goes, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified with you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? So let's look at what he says here, starting at verse 10. Let's go back. Go ahead and put it up. Verse 10 and 11. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly united in mind and thought, he says, and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels dear brothers and sisters. Then by the time we reach, this is chapter one, by the time we reach chapter 11, they're still fussing and fighting over communion. And we're gonna take communion today. Hopefully there won't be any fights that break out. Now, was this the first time in the Bible that people had fought during communion? No. Remember when Jesus gathered the disciples around the table, what we call Holy Thursday, and broke bread? Luke chapter 22 says, a dispute broke out among them who would be the greatest. So there have always been divisions with God's people, but this should not be the fact. Uh, German Lutheran pastor theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was martyred by the Nazis in 1945 for resistance. But before he died, he wrote several books, and one book he wrote was a book on Christian community called Life Together. And in it he says, what unites us, now think about here, what unites us is not liking each other even. What unites us is the body and blood of Christ. What unites us is Jesus. We come from different backgrounds, church backgrounds, political backgrounds. Here in this church, we're Republicans, we are Democrats, we are independents. We are people with many different experiences of life. In this church, we are Cleveland Browns fans, and then we have normal people. (laughs) Who day? I'm looking at Mark. Right? We are a diverse group. But what unites us is what we're going to do today. What unites us is right around this table. We come in the name of Christ together. Don't forget that on the night that Jesus broke bread, he also went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed what's called in Luke 17, the the high priestly prayer of Jesus. John 17, sorry where he prayed that the disciples would be one uh, as he is one with the Father. And then he prays, not just for the disciples to be one, he prays that those who come and believe in his name. That's the reason why Ginsburg will not, will not leave when other people leave, because God calls us to be one, calls us to the table, to stay at the table, to be one. That's why we call for unity, not division, because Jesus is calling disciples to come together. One thing we need to remember is that oneness does not mean sameness. Amen? John Wesley, in his famous sermon entitled, A Character of a Methodist, what makes a Methodist, he says, as of opinions that do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think. So he picked up during that time on a popular saying, in the essentials, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Meaning in the essentials, what makes us who we are that defines us, listen, there are absolutes. We are not atheists. We are theists. We believe there's a God who's different than us, who has revealed himself to us fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the essentials, we believe in the triune God. We believe in the deity of Jesus. We believe in salvation. We believe in, I can go down the list of um, the articles of religion. We believe in these things that hold us together. 
But there are some opinions that do not strike where we allow liberty, that strike the root within the church. Let me give you a couple. What would be some of those opinions? There are, there are a lot of them. Let me give you a, a couple. One would be how we dress. That's an easy one. Pastor picked an easy one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> how we dress in church. Because in some churches, there's certain styles. You have to have a suit on. You have to have a dress on. You have to have your hair a certain way. You have to look a certain way. Here we've said as long as, you know, you're decent. We don't care what you, what you wear. But there are some people that just don't see that. In fact, my father, who is a, a dear of uh, Jesus followers, 92 years old, in a nursing facility. He listens via YouTube later in the week. He goes to his own little church in the nursing home. He listens to his son, so hi dad, later this week. He thinks my best preaching is when I wear a robe. If I have a preaching robe on, then it's a great sermon. So I just want to tell you folks, you've not in the last two years heard my best preaching yet. <laughs> it, it'll get better, I'll tell you. I may have to do that next week. But that's what he says. Good sermon, but you didn't wear your robe today. And I say, I, at this point, he's my dad. They say, I understand, dad. Thank you for sharing your insights today. Okay? So there are different things that we can have liberty. Here's another, worship styles. Whoa, whoa, this is, there's been more controversy in church splits over the last 40 years in our country over worship styles than about anything else. Let's just make sure you're still awake here and I'm not putting you to sleep. Show of hands. How many people grew up worship style, let's say Episcopalian? Anyone here? There was no one, nobody in the first service. No one, okay. How about Roman Catholic? A few. Okay, very traditional service. Well, we're one with the, the Episcopalians and Catholics when it comes to the core of the gospel. There are many differences, but, but in Jesus, right? The Ankin Church, we actually, that's part of our heritage. John Wesley was an Ankin priest, right? But we're not Anglican. We're not Roman Catholic. How many people grew up Baptist? Well, we love our Baptist friends, if you're listening. We love you. We are one with the Baptist, but Gingsburg, we're not Baptist here. How many grew up in the style of Quaker? Does anybody even know what that is? Silent worship. I learned a lot about the Quakers when I served down near Wilmington. Wilmington College is a friend's college, a Quaker college, right? Of silent worship where you don't really have a preacher for the day, at least in the old school Quakers, you wait till the spirit moves. How many people grew up in Pentecostal? Okay. What about Lutheran? Okay. Many different experiences. You, do, do you know, do you know the, the, uh, the style, this Methodist kid here was most foreign to? It was just like I couldn't understand. I went to church every single week. Pentecostal. I mean, that was just weird to me, charismatic, you know, raising your hands, doing this, dancing. I mean, couldn't these guys get it under control? You know, I didn't know that was church was about. I grew up in a church. I mean, doesn't God have a sense of humor now I'm here? <laughs> but I grew up in a church where, you know, if somebody raised their hands in church team, someone else would call 911. <laughs> it was like there's a stick up or something coming in here. The minister would say, if you raise your hands in church, I'm going to lower the ceiling fans. I mean, that was the environment that I raised in. Okay. But what I'm saying is there can be diversity. Then I got older and I realized raising your hands was just an ancient form of prayer. That's, and praise. That's the way the ancients would often pray. Here I am, Lord. I'm not coming to you with closed arms. I'm coming to you saying, here I am. I surrender my whole life to you today. Use me as you will today. And so there are many different styles. Now, let's be honest. We face cultural, social, theological challenges far greater than worship styles or dress in the church, no doubt. In our own Methodist denomination, we've split and we continue to split out more and more even here. So how do we stay together? What's going to be our plan here, pastor? 
I want to give you two things we're going to do. You can know that when you come to Gingersburg Church, this is what we're about. If you're new and wondering, I'm going to tell you right here, and I want you to write these down. I want you to get these in your mind, okay? Two things, there are many more, but two common things we're going to focus on and how we're going to be united as a church, even in very divided times, if we stick to these two things. Number one, let's keep our focus on Jesus Christ and the cross. Amen? I love this. Yeah. We can clap for Jesus. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, let's go back to the scripture here. That's what the apostle Paul is saying in the second chapter, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. He says to the Corinthians, when I first came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan as if I'm coming to you with some ideology, some political uh, debate, with some great idea that no other church has. And if you just follow our church, you'll have the secret to life right here. He says, I did not come that way. He says this, he says, for I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who is crucified. Now, let's put this into context. He said, when I first came to you. So when did he first come to them? Well, we find in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, we find the apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, he made his way to what we know as Greece today. And he visited Athens, the university town. Rachel and I have been to Athens, Greece, twice in our lives. We've stood there on Mars Hill where the Apostle Paul stood. This would be the place where all the great debates in the Roman world would happen. Other places too, but this was the center of learning. And the Apostle Paul heard the great minds. He heard the political debaters. He heard about the ideologies. He heard the right and he heard the left. He heard the solutions to what the world needs. He heard all the, even, he even presented himself and he talked a little bit about the resurrection. Some people rejected it, but there were a few people who, who believed. And so he heard everything that the world had to offer. Read Acts chapter 18. But then he went 60 miles south to Corinth to Las Vegas, and he said, I was determined that I was just going to preach Jesus. I've heard it all. I've heard every solution every politician has, and I'm determined that I'm going to simply preach Christ and him crucified because it's in the work of Christ on the cross and the power of the resurrection that, friends, we are changed. That's our testimony. And so I want you to know that as long as I'm your pastor, what this church is going to be about is that we're going to preach Jesus and him crucified. Amen? Amen. The main thing is to keep the main thing. And so today I just want to say, I want to invite you to Christ. I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you to deny yourself and pick up the cross and follow Jesus today. Let's keep our focus. There are a lot of different things we can do, but let's keep our focus on the cross. Number one. Number two, very simple. Let us simply love like Jesus loves. Let us simply, that's the ultimate mark of what it means to be a Christian. To be a Jesus follower is to love like Jesus loves. And that's what John Wesley said was the distinguishing mark of a Methodist. To love God and love other people. Let us love like Jesus loves. Now, we believe the whole scripture in context, so we have to understand it. First Corinthians is a letter he's firing off to address church problems. He begins talking about a lot of messes in the church, and then he, he's leading them to a place. He talks about even having gifts in the church, gifts of prophecy, gifts of healing, gifts of preaching, and, and all these things. But in chapter 12, he's leading them to another chapter. What is that? Chapter 13. Now, we know chapter 13 if we've ever been to a wedding. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud, right? 
does not seek its own. Every wedding seems like in Miami County for the last 100 years has read 1 Corinthians 17. Not every wedding, but you get the point. These things remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? Okay, so you've heard that too, right? Well, that's not an isolated, just nice wedding chapter. He's addressed all these problems, and then he goes in the last verse of verse 12. I love this. He says, I want to tell you about all this that could be in the church. And then he says, and write this down, because I'm going to come back to it next two weeks. Let me show you the most excellent way. (laughs) I love that. I want to show you the way above all way. Then he jumps in to the love chapter. The beyond it all. You could speak in tongues. You could have great prophecy. Look at me. But if you do not have love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, number one fruit, then all of that is just making noise, clanging cymbals, he says. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13 too. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that could be mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And so let us love like Jesus loves. Certainly, we're going to teach the Bible here. Certainly, pastor is going to stand on God's word. But in times where we disagree over the interpretation of the Bible, which will happen, let's make sure that we're still loving like Jesus loves. I think that's the model of Jesus. Jesus eats with everyone. We have that saying here at this church. Where does that come from? It comes from the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus saw Zacchaeus in a tree, said, I'm coming to your house for dinner, okay? He met with Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. He was a sinner. He um, was not a good guy. Jesus didn't go to his house to condone his tax collecting. So there may be people that you disagree with in their behavior, but Jesus ate with them. Didn't excuse it, but he ate with them. What happened to Zacchaeus? He found the Lord. He ended up repenting. He ended up, and Jesus said, salvation's come to this house. So here's the point. Jesus eats with everyone. Even Zacchaeus. Even you. Ooh. Yeah, the, new, the you that no one else knows but Jesus. And he still eats with you. Even Pastor Dennis. Jesus eats with everyone. Sisters and brothers, can we simply at this church love like Jesus loves? One of the prayers that I've been praying this year is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, because I've needed to pray it in my own life, of frustration. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Help me love like Jesus loves. I'm going to close with a story. You couldn't get out of here without a story true story. One of the highlights of traveling to Vietnam seven times on mission trips over the past decade is to return with Vietnam veterans. One Vietnam veteran that I traveled with in 2010 was a pastor in Waverly, Ohio named Rick Dean. Now, Rick, um, he was a basketball superstar, MVP basketball player at Syracuse University. He graduated in 1967, had several NBA teams wanting him, and you can Google him. He, he, he's, got, he's got records. But upon graduation, he loved his country so much, instead of going right to the NBA, he decided to enlist in the army, and he went to Vietnam. He served as a division leader, platoon leader, the 101st Airborne, and he fought in the Battle of the Way, where he was defending a bridge, and he lost 11 of his men. 11 Americans in the battle. So one of the things that he wanted to do is go back to Vietnam and remember and to remember those brothers in arms. Now, I understand it's very sensitive. There are those who have fought who would never want to go back. And please know of my prayers and and love and also deep uh, uh, gratitude and understanding But there are others who want to go back for a time of healing. He wanted to go back. And so one of the things we did, not only we were ministering, but we were also going back and we were going to lay a reef in the river 
and try to find it around the area because we didn't actually know where the battle was. And so we did that. It was very, very moving. And I'm younger than him, of course. Uh, Rick passed away, by the way, in I think 2012, but the time was 2010. So uh, he, he shared, and I remember we were staying out there, we had prayers, and then he shared like some of the stories, very moving. So we were going back to our hotel in, in Wei or Da Nang, and we're talking, and we're on the bus with several Vietnamese pastors, Methodist pastors who we were with. And we were all telling our stories, and they were telling their testimony. And one guy spoke up, he was a little younger than Rick, older than me, kind of in the middle of us. And he said, I want you to hear my story. He said, I am the sixth son in our family, and I am the youngest. All five of my brothers were recruited by the Viet, no, Viet Cong to fight in the war against you, against the Americans. He said, the only reason why I did not fight is because I was too young. They came into our village and they recruited us, and so we were to defend our homeland, and so we, they did. And he said, all five of my brothers were killed in the war. All five of my brothers were killed by Americans. He said, I hated the Americans. Now, can you imagine, put your own self aside. We love our country, but think about your family. Think about the feelings. And he said that it was just a deep hurt and pain. But he says, over the years as I got older, I came to know Jesus Christ. I was pulled out of a life of of Buddhism into Christianity. And I discovered Jesus. And I became a pastor. I was schooled in the teachings of Wesley as well in theology. And, and he says, God began to heal that hurt and gave me a deep love for people that I really didn't know. And he told his testimony of how he was a different person. And we were just kind of all awestruck. We were talking about ourselves and our own families and our own hurts. And he's pouring out his life. So, of course, every night, if you've been on a mission trip, you know one of the special things, you get back to the camp, you get back to the compound, you get back to the hotel, you're telling stories. We always circled the wagons, and so Rick is telling the story. We're saying, what just happened to us today out there? And we're just, it was just us, the American pastors, who were there. And so Rick is retelling the story to me, which I was there, but also to others who were not there, about how this guy lost his brothers. But then Rick said, I'll never forget this. Now, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a hero, he was a silver star and bronze star hero. He said, I realize at this point, because he was carrying all this hurt in his heart, if that pastor could forgive, then I could too. That's the power of the gospel. There were two disciples of Jesus, that if they would have known each other apart from Jesus, they would have torn each other apart. They were foes in life. One was Simon the Zealot. Who was that? He was basically a guerrilla warfighter against the tyranny of Rome. And the other person was Matthew the tax collector. His sole purpose, other than feeding his own pocket was to raise money to support the Roman war machine. But in the presence of Jesus, they became friends. Last thought, picture Jesus on Good Friday hanging on the cross, suffering for the world. He looks down and sees the two people in his life on earth that he's closest to, who were they? John, the beloved, his best friend, and his mother, Mary. And he says to John, behold your mother. And he says to Mary, behold your son. My friends at Gingsburg, the closer we come to the cross, the more family we become. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've made, that we gather around the table. We are different people from different worlds. We have different beliefs in politics, and that's okay. But we come together in our differences right around this table. We know what unites us. We come and break bread, and we share life. We stand at the foot of the cross. 
And so today, Lord, unite our hearts. For those in this room that have never come into a personal relationship with you of denying self and living for Christ, may this be the day as they take that bread, as they take that cup, may they experience your new life in Christ. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Take a moment and just lift anything up that's not pleasing to God in your life right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, descend upon these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And through your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other until we feast together, together at your heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. I know that the hour is late, but, there, but we've come to the place. There's no more important time than this. I'd like to invite our servants to come and take their places. We're going to be receiving communion today by intinction where the team will wash their hands and they'll break off a piece of bread and you can dip part of it into the cup. If you prefer to have an individual wafer and juice, we have personal um, packets here for you and gluten-free today. If you desire not to take communion today for any reason, that's fine. There's absolutely no pressure, but you're welcome you need not be a member of this church. If you desire to share in communion and love Jesus, we invite you to come forward today. I invite everyone to stand. It'll be easier to move that way. But let's be in a spirit of praise and prayer as we share together. Amen. today, whether it's today or whether it's sometime this week, to be sure to take a moment to reflect, to remember, to be thankful. That's, that's why we gather at the table for communion. It's a chance for us to honor and remember what Jesus did for us and also how Jesus, by that great sacrifice and then his resurrection from the dead, how he gives us hope and meaning and purpose so that we can live with this kind of love. So whether it's today, whether you have that bread and that juice with you to remember the body of Christ that was broken for you and the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Or maybe you're joining us and you're at work right now and you don't have elements, you don't have bread or juice available. I just want to encourage you to take some time at some point in the near future. Maybe it's when you finish your shift today or maybe it's sometime later this week and you just tear some bread and just remember that, that Jesus' body was broken for you. And then as you dip it in the, the juice or if you drink the juice, you just remember that his blood was shed for you so that we could have life. 
And I know we, we, we were talking earlier, we we're having some fun with the questions about the hot dogs and the, the toilet paper and the pineapple, but really, we're, we're so divided. I mean, everything seems like it's more and more divided now than it ever has been. But as we were talking about, as Pastor Dennis shared from, from Scripture, it's been this way for centuries. It's been this way for centuries, but that's why it's so important for us to to stand as one, to be united together as one, as the body of Christ. And and he he used that line, sameness doesn't equal oneness. And it made me think of the U2 song, One. There's a line in that song that says, we're one, but we're not the same. You know, yeah, we may disagree on pizza toppings or, or different things like that, but those are not the things that matters. The things that matter are that, that we believe in Jesus and that we love one another and that we are committed to serving together. We're committed to following Jesus together. And then setting that example, modeling that example of, as Paul calls it later in 1 Corinthians, the more excellent way, the most excellent way. And that's, that's how we need to model and live for the, the people in our lives, for our family, for our friends, for our neighbors, for our cities, for our communities. Just imagine what it would look like if we loved as Jesus loved, as we love and show the love that comes from knowing Jesus. And so just to remember these couple of things that we need to keep our focus on Jesus and on the cross. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing, because only Jesus has the power to heal and to restore and to save. And then also let us simply love like Jesus. I know that's what I've been talking about for the last few minutes. That's what Pastor Dennis talked about today. Just imagine what the world would look like if if everyone lived with the love of Jesus. And, And we shouldn't throw our witness out because we disagree. That should be even more reason to show the love of Jesus and to to share our witness with those around us. And the nearer we come to the cross, the more family we become. So what is one way that you can share the love of Jesus with those around you? So I hope you'll join us again next week. This week we talked about living united in a divided church. Next week, we're going there. We're talking about politics, but not in a way you may think. We're asking the question, should followers of Jesus be political? It's going to be a great conversation. It's going to be, especially leading here in the United States, we're, we're in an election year. We have another cycle of, of debates and attack ads and all these different things. So much setting out to divide us. So that's the question we're asking. Should we even be political? So join us next week. I hope you will. It'll be a great conversation, and uh, and we'll we'll see what the Bible says. And then I want to encourage you to check us out. Check out our Facebook groups. Join us in the Ginghamsburg group. Join us in the Ginghamsburg Praise Facebook group. Join us in Discord. We talked about Discord last week. It's another great place to hang out. We'd love to connect with you there. And if you're joining us on YouTube today, please be sure to hit that subscribe button. Now, as we close, I want to leave you with a word of encouragement and a word of blessing. Just to remember that even if you may be physically by yourself today, please remember that you are not alone. God sees you. God knows your name. God knows your need. God knows exactly what you're going through. And God loves you. And we here at Ginghamsburg, we see you and we love you. So God bless you. I hope you have an incredible week and we'll see you again soon. God bless you.